All right, all right, all right. Good morning, everybody. Look at Jack's hat. He's so, he's so proud of this thing. I'm, I'm, it's thrilled, amazing. I'm thrilled you like it. It's, uh, it's a little gift I gave him. I day. absolutely love it. Look at this. Make South Africa great again. A.K.A. Msaga. <laughs> yes, sir. And don't you think Msaga sounds like it should be a South African word? It really should. Right? It really should. Yeah. Like, like from now on, when someone does something absolutely great, which is, yeah, that's that that's that and Msaga, it, man. And it's got a it's got a tone that could only be South African Msaga. Yeah. And it almost sounds like uh, Mslaba. You know, it's like yeah. it's something slightly violent. Like we want it to happen quite badly. It's it's it's, <laughs> it's got a ominous but great thing about it, right? Msaga. Msaga. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Make South Africa great again. <laughs> if you never hear a word I say for the rest of your life, remember these five words. Make South Africa great again. That's going to be your theme going forward, right? That's yes, your sir. thing. That's Jack's <laughs> thing. All right. <laughs> Let's did. get it. You did the Donald Trump move there, which is funny because uh, this is what Bill Maher calls his two dick move. Mm -hmm. right? And he goes like this sometimes, Donald Trump. Yeah. Um, and Bill Maher, who I love. Oh, my God. I must quickly tell you something. I, so I was listening to my usual range of podcasts while I was doing stuff yesterday, at the gym and all the rest of it. He had an interview with Billy D. Williams. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lando Calrissian yes, from yes, Star yes, Wars. Yes, yes, Superb guy. I mean, like easily one of the like great, Great actors of Hollywood, yeah. and that voice is inescapable. Like yeah, I love him, right? And you know, voice, he yeah. he had a he had a record contract once. I can believe that. Yeah. I can believe that. So anyway, Billy D. Williams turns out to be one of those amazing people. I I can tell you who they are. It's him. It's Robert De Niro. It's the late Prince Philip. And maybe there are a couple of other ones that I've forgotten. But I think maybe. Charlton Heston used to be in that crew. Mm -hmm. And I've seen Denzel Washington do the same thing, where they have figured out they're so good at being in front of cameras and in front of microphones that they have made it very difficult to interview them. Mm. They are contrary, contrarian, contrary on purpose. Yeah. So you say... Yeah, tell me about a bit about your life, and then they'll go. Well, you know, I've had I've had a lot of really interesting experiences, and I've, I've had a very good time. Yeah, but but acting isn't always a good time. No, it, yes, it is. <laughs> you know, so so it's like as soon as you say X, they will say y. y. Yeah, and I heard for the first time ever, and this just kind of humbled me at the same time as making me, uh, making me laugh because. Interviewing people is something that I have done for a long time, and I've, I've, I've picked up a couple of skills. Mm -hmm. But here I heard Bill Maher just floundering with Billy D. Williams. Billy oh, D. Wow. Williams just had him over a barrel. It yeah. was like, you know what? Here's this guy who I think has interviewed them all. He's got a good sense of humor. He's a stand-up com comedy, comedian, yeah. comedian uh, Bill Maher. So he can do anything on stage, and he, mm -hmm. he knows his he knows his ability. He's good at making people, putting people at ease, and also putting them on the spot. Well. I mean, Billy D. Williams just makes an absolute. There's always that makes one it guy, so right? Rocky for him. It's and and it was, it was such a bad interview, uh, even for Bill that I had to listen the whole way through. <laughs> I just had to listen. To it. I it's mean, those, it's so bad I can't watch. It did nothing to my opinion of <laughs> Billy D. Williams, who I love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it it kind of just made Bill look really ordinary and human for the first time in ages so it was a good one to listen to he's got this uh interview show he does called club random yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Where he sits and interviews famous people but he talks to them about everything except politics i mean politics sometimes comes up you can't avoid sure, it you can't but, um, it also depends on the guest right yeah mm -hmm. and and it's so funny like billy d williams because you know bill makes all these jokes about like yeah you must have got so much pussy in your day and all this Billy d williams goes what a crude and Vulgar thing to see. <laughs> you see Bill's like, Shit, what have I done now? Like all the face just, I mean, the blood in his face. Just... All his usual, because I've heard Bill Maher do it, a lot of interviews, so I know what he's all about, you know, mm -hmm. which kind of angles he takes. He was just stuck. Didn't know what to do, the guy. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Uh, and it's kind of fun to see that there are still people in the world who can do that. Right. Right. And like, um, yeah, there's this doing. joke that Eddie Griffin once said that that I keep in mind all the time. It's like, you thought you were Billy Badass, 
mm. until you ran into Billy Badass. Uh -huh. Billy Badass whooped that ass, <laughs> and you figured out, I'm good at math. <laughs> I love that. So Billy D. Williams is oh, Billy Badass. He's Billy Badass. Mm -hmm. That's so good. I love it. Uh, no, no. Very, very cool. And uh, what an interesting interview. Anyway, so you're wearing the Make South Africa Great Again hat, which we are. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them on, online for sale at some point because I know a lot of people want them. Yes, sir. I'm hoping we can do that before the election, but otherwise they will be available at some point. So mm -hmm. anybody who's interested... Um, Keep an eye out. We'll we'll get those to you. Yeah, and I'm planning on wearing this the whole day. Okay. Well, I mean, it's yours. You can do rain, what you want. Rain or shine. There, there will be. I'm just, I'm just warning you in advance. There will be people who do not like that hat, and just like in America, that you know, the minute you wear that, they assume a lot about you. They assume that you're a a Trump supporter, and that's why I made them because I think yeah. in South Africa we don't really have those. People actually really like Donald Trump in Africa. Yes, this is the do. funny thing that Democrats hate to admit. Mm -hmm. So like black people in Africa, what they know about America is a whole lot of, of weird and disparate things. But they know that if you think about the ultimate American, most black Africans will say Donald Trump. Yep. Which may piss off people on the East and West Coast. But we don't care. Who think we might say a name like Gore Vidal or... You know, Bill Clinton or Barack Obama, or but they won't. They'll say Donald Trump. Yeah. To most South Africans, Africans, Black Africans, people across the world, in fact, mm. outside of America, they will say Donald Trump if you ask them for a quintessential and it's American. It's crazy. Like that, that, what you just said would not have been a point of contention up until he ran for president. Everyone loved Donald Trump just up until he ran for president. Yeah. Which oh. is so strange. Remember like Don King was his best friend. I remember someone sent me a clip of, of him defending Michael Jackson when everyone else was climbing yep. into my... He said, I don't know. People say the most... A lot of people are saying the most terrible things about me and they mm -hmm. don't know me. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have said terrible things about Michael Jackson, but I'll tell you, he's a sweet guy. He's a sweet guy. I've never had a problem where he spent a lot of time with us at Mar-a-Lago. He spent a lot of time with me in New York. He's he a good guy. He likes my gold <laughs> toilet. He likes my gold. He thinks well, it's shiny. Yeah, Michael did. Yeah. But um, then suddenly he ran for president. And then all of a sudden he's non like, what the hell just happened? Mm. And I think... He yeah. he brought a lot of ill feelings to the surface. A lot wow. of things were kind of bubbling under in the States. And, you know, he but showed he, up but, and he was like, okay, guys, there's a flip side to this coin. Again, like what you got to realize is that people love to project a whole lot of their shit onto you. Mm. And that's why when you wear a, a hat like that or you wear a T-shirt with some kind of writing on it. Um, and I, I steadfastly avoid wearing anything with any brand label or anything on it. Yeah. I've, I've tried that for the last, I don't know, 10 years. You're not going to find a picture of me with writing on it. Mm. And not because I've got some worry that I'm supporting some shitty brand or anything. Like, you know, a lot of millennials, yeah, your, yeah, yeah, your yeah, people will yeah. go, oh, no, we can't support this brand because they exploit animals. Or, right. You know, they make their shirts in a Chinese sweatshop or something. I don't give a shit about that. Yeah. For me, it's about, I'm not going to be your billboard. Right? That's it. And the funny thing is that a lot of people want to project stuff onto others. And they also want stuff projected onto them. Mm. They want to be associated with this, but not with that. Mm. I'm like, a lot of this stuff you're not going to get out of just looking at someone's hat. You, you might all. have to actually ask them some questions. Not at all. I mean, th at the <laughs> end of the day... It's you, a lot of work. Like, for whatever reason, uh, because we live in the, you know, 30 second attention span yeah. people think that you can wrap up an individual as far as what they think and feel mm -hmm. in 30 seconds it's not going to happen mm -hmm. it is not going to happen in fact i've got a couple of words for those people that might walk up to me today and be on some door why are you wearing that hat we're going to have a chat oh, actually yeah. oh yeah there will be yes there'll be someone who needs to needs to uh deal with your problematic outfit Oh, that. yes, yes, just the head. There are like, people, oh. people who genuinely think that their purpose in life, and these, by the way, are the worst people, mm. um, the ones who want to re-brainwash you because your brainwashing didn't work the first time, so mm. they've got to fix you. 
And and it's like we are some monolith. Like all of us are supposed to think the same way. Like God forbid someone comes up with something new. Like oh, what the hell? Especially, and you get a lot of this shit. And and someone's brought up Coleman Hughes in the comments here, which yeah. we'll talk about in a second. But you know, the minute uh, and and Penwell was here talking about this with me the other night too. Um, the minute you are a young black person and you don't toe the normal middle of the road line. Mm-hmm. You're not like a fan of Panyaza the Sufi or the ANC or you or you're not some left winger. They're like, what the hell? In fact, Penwell actually tweeted about that. Yeah. And I commented on it and said to him, you know, I know by me even commenting on this is gonna cause even more shit for you. Mm. But well done. Yeah, I mean it's I, I, it, I, not because you agree with me, because you're brave enough to say to what say you it. actually think instead of what everybody else wants you to think. Thank you. Right? And it's funny how a lot of people um say some of these things because they want to be on the right side of history. Well, well they just want to we're be pop- living they in just the want to present. Be popular. That's the problem. They want they think everybody will like them and secretly <sighs> all they want is acceptance. It's not that they want to be respected for their opinions or that they even have opinions. They choose the most popular point of view. Right. And they espouse that because they hope it will in turn make them popular. Because they wear a hat because they think it'll make them popular. Mm. They wear a certain brand because they hope someone will love them. And I, it's, it's maybe if I buy that Gucci belt, someone will love me finally. It's ridiculous. All of this shit starts from the inside, man. <laughs> like the reason I can say what I want, think how I want, wear whatever hat I want to wear mm. is because I do this weird thing that human beings used to do. It's called thinking. Oh, and no, no, no. it's very dangerous. This. And and you know, I I am so very proud dangerous. of the fact that I can do that. Listen, got to tell you two quick things. First of all, because one is in the news. Remind me, Marcus Yusta. We got to talk sure, about that in sure. a second. But yeah. I drove here this morning in a friend of mine's old 1995 Land Rover Defender. Yeah, I saw it this morning. Yeah, yes, this this thing like you you can go. Max 110 kilometers. Now, okay? <laughs> yeah. And in these conditions this morning, I mean, there's no air con, there's no, your windscreen wipers are this big. It's ridiculous. Mm. Um, I love driving this car though, because I'm, I'm actually in the market for one, to be perfectly honest. So that's why I'm testing it out. And this friend of mine's got like five of them and he said, come and try this one. Right. I'm doing the different kinds. Mm-hmm. Anyway, this thing, the, the, the window is steaming up so badly because it doesn't have any kind of internal... You, all you have is a vent that you open mm. and it lets the air in and some of the rain as well. Oh, wow. That's all you've got. This is proper old school. Oh, dude. Mm. Uh, it, it sounds like a tractor. Yeah. And the bright lights are about as bright as my torch on my iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> it is, you're sitting very high up. Yeah. <laughs> it's, he hasn't touched the in, inside of it. So At all. The original... No, there's no souping up of anything. Mechanically, it's fine. Yeah. And it's an awesome car, and I'm loving driving it. I mm, really am. Mm. But <laughs> this thing, it was treacherous this morning. Yeah. It was it, the most treacherous drive I've had in ages. And I, I thought yesterday was tough. We spoke about this with Leanne because it's bucketing down. Yes, Anybody it is. who doesn't know, Joburg has basically become a tropical rainforest. Yeah. In the last two days, yeah, it somehow mutated into London somehow. I, I don't know. No, no, no. Worse, it's monsoon. In yeah, the- it's it's bad. It's bad. And you know that the 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 car you're talking about, like, I feel like um, if more people from this generation got an understanding of those kind of cars, they'd realize just how far we've come well, as a human species. The thing I love about them, since we're talking about it, is that they are mechanical. Yep. They are not electronic. Mm -mm. So some light doesn't come on. I mean, I don't even know what lights are coming on half the time. And maybe (laughs) maybe I should be worried about some of them. But this it's a mechanical vehicle. Yeah. It's not it's not something that's run by a computer. Mm -mm. Uh, they don't plug diagnostics into it. You have to actually open the hood, get in there. And smack it with a spanner. Yeah. And, you know, there's stuff you have to do. Mm-hmm. And I sort of like that. That maybe, maybe because I'm developing an appreciation for older things, and I've always had an appreciation for older things, but also for things that are real workhorses. Yeah. The stuff. There was that brilliant speech that Kennedy made before they went to the moon in 1962. He said, 
We do these and the other things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why they wanted to go to the moon. Yep. Because it would have been easier to just say, ah, let's not go to the moon. Yeah. What do we need to do that? For? Let Russia do that. Stuff. Yeah, let yeah. Russia win the space race. It's not a big deal. But man, once you set that goal, you've got to fulfill. Mm -hmm. And then you have to discover all of the things that you'll need to propel you into, the, into space to get you to orbit around that hunk of rock. Yep. And you've got to land on it. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to get the people back from it. Safely. So we've got to do hard things. Again. We have to. We really have to. So this is interesting. Um, and we'll get to the politics just now. Remind me, Marcus Huesta. Well, Marcus Huesta, yeah, yeah. Because it's bizarre. Well, it's, it's the first headline, so we'll uh, get into that. Patrick says, R.W. Johnson, who is actually, he's proven to be one of the most insightful of all of South Africa's analysts. Every time I turn on the TV, I see some new analyst. There's, there he's, got no dozen, hey. yeah, he's got no track record. I see them talking the biggest heap of shit, and I'm like, okay, obviously this show... The producers of the show just needed someone to fill that seat. Mm. So they, they found someone who studied political science in 1983 and they called them up and they, their phone worked. Yeah. And they said, can you get to the studio or can you sit in front of a camera? And they, this is how, because these people add no value. Today, we have someone who really does add value coming in. Mm -hmm. I've been keen to have her in the studio for some time. Um, Lorenza Eckhart, who does yeah. a show on CakeNet which is an actuality show. And she's been a journalist for some 10 years or more and interviews some amazing people. So she's got some insights that I think will be very valuable. Yeah. But I keep seeing people on South African television and I think, how the hell? And even on, on radio, I suppose, because I don't listen, but I'm sure, I'm sure they end up there as well. How the hell did you get to a point where anyone was interested in your analysis? Because R.W. Johnson, who's in the comments here with Patrick, says a bunch of stuff, but it turns out he's very good at getting the numbers Exactly right. Dead right, yeah. yeah. So Congo, Chris, and uh, Patrick say, R.W. Johnson gives MK 36% in KZN, KZN and 13% for the ANC. Yes. Yeah, that is and, very interesting. And I suppose he means nationally MK 11%. 11%, yeah. That would be a phenomenal result for a yes. party that nobody really knows anything about except Jacob Zuma. Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing. We know nothing about MK. Yeah. Do you? Nope. All I know is that they're in court right now. Did you see any of that, by the way? I, I saw um, a couple of clips on X and I, I read the article on Daily Maverick. So they, they dropped the article at like midnight. And saw my two lawyers uh, yes. go, going at each other. Yes. Those, so like, those gentlemen. This. Those yeah. guys are so cool. When I say my two lawyers, I mean Dalim Bofu and Tembeg Angukai Tobi, who both yes. represented me in my case against Mnet when we won and beat the fuck out of them. I'm mm -hmm. just going to keep reminding people. <laughs> we beat them. We hum humiliated them. Yes. They and had, th had 14 lawyers and Vim Trengrove and me and Tembega and Dali mm -hmm. and Eric Mabuza. Yes, sir. We took them on. And we won. And ha -ha. it was established as uh, part of public record that Gareth Cliff is, in fact, not a racist. Yeah, in fact, if you call me that, you can go to jail. Defamation <laughs> of character. <laughs> I'm the only person in the country who you can, if you call me a racist, I could actually just tell. <laughs> well, I, I don't have to do anything. I just have to tell the sheriff of the court or, right. you know. And this can, guy is casting aspersions over here. Right, because it was it's in the record now. Yes, which is it is hilarious. I mm. mean, if if the if there was ever an unforeseen consequence of that case, it was that. But anyway, I'm um, so in this case, uh, tell me your what lawyers you saw. No. are up against one another, mm. and I think what I got from it, like I don't want to go into the nitty gritties of Section 19 and law, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, what I'm trying to understand is the precedent that will be set if Jacob Zuma wins this court case. That well, would mean... It would mean criminals yes. are able to stand for president. Correct. Now, that was, that was not an issue in ancient Rome. Mm. For all those people who are purists, mm -hmm. let me remind you that there were many people in the Senate in Rome and there were people who ran for consul during the Republic. Yeah. And there were many emperors after the Republic who did not even stand for election but were openly criminal. Yep. We know they committed horrendous and heinous crimes. Everything from, you know, white collar stuff to murders, mm. and rapes, and yeah, yeah, horrible yeah. things. 
So that's that's the question I walk away with is what what type of future are we headed towards? Are we going to be the country of second chances? Like if you were behind bars and you have been rehabilitated somehow? Are we could already possibly Tony run Mangani, <laughs> Shabir Sheikh? Ah, but aren't we already? But we're Marcus talking about USD. we're talking about the president of the country, Gareth. We can't have a former convict as the president of the country. Well, so I heard Tembaga. He was he was arguing exactly this. He said he is a criminal because that is what the courts declared him to be. Thank you. And he did and it knowingly. By put the him way. into jail. And as a criminal, our constitution says you cannot be president. Case closed, as far as I'm concerned. And and Tembega Ngukai Tobi is uh, Ngukai Tobi. Sorry, is I mean I I kind of had forgotten how erudite the man is. Mm. He puts a very good show together in court. Yeah, and I saw does. Dali got into a bit of a scrap with the judges because they said body language matters. Mm-hmm. He kind of while one of the female judges was talking to him, he raised his shoulders and grabbed his file and started looking through papers almost as a distraction yeah so that he wasn't listening to her and that the other judge i think the the senior of the judges said mr mbofu please listen to the question before you start rummaging around in your notes yeah it's very rude Mm -hmm. and it was a bit of a reprimand so it's not going well for him at this point from what i could tell yep and i mean look it's that's what the law is about right you get two people who are on different sides of the argument and whoever puts the best argument forward wins yeah that's that's what a court's meant to do provide Uh, you with the ability to do that right the ripple effect of it as i said the precedent that will be set i'm not too happy about it so i think well they need to apply it equally though yeah but this is not the constitutional court right and in order to change the law Mm -hmm. because the law is as and Becca said, it's fairly clear. It's like you can't you be can't do president it. if you are a criminal. So shout you out, Gaten. You can't run for president if you're a criminal. Gaten. Yeah, of course. Mm. This is a big problem for him. But he's yeah. unlikely to win and so is Jacob Zuma. So right. are they allowed to at least run? Who knows? This is what they're going to decide. But if they're not going to change the law in this respect. Mm-hmm. They, all they will do is enforce the law. That's what the judiciary is there to do. They don't interpret the law they don't activate they don't become activist judges and change the we law would themselves. hope not yeah well we, we don't we not, don't yeah. have that we don't have that problem that america has in that respect mm, mm-hmm. yeah. well ultimately we'll 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 see what happens i mean the 29th of um may i understand is what 49 days away f- from now hmm. and we are just around the corner time will tell i'm just hoping that um because i mean when jacob zuma was arrested uh this country kind of went bellies up uh, i hope that doesn't happen this time around like whatever the courts say like jacob zuma needs to let his people know that what the court behave. says stands or let them behave badly, and then we know what we're up against as a nation. These are then they declare themselves outlaws, and they become like Robin Hood and his band of thieves, and mm. uh, that's what we have to deal with. Ah. Again, there are precedents for all of this in history. Then we'll see. We'll Rob, see. Robin Hood may not be the best precedent for it, but there but, are there are many examples of people who have um, got a mob on their side, and, yeah, and, and and kind of tried to force the country to accept them. I don't think we get it. I don't think that's going to go down. It didn't work the last time. Yeah, you know. Let's let's just hope we've got a bit more sense this time around. Uh, so we've got a busy day today. Uh, apparently, and I don't know if you've ended up in these conversation. It ha- conversations that happened to me yesterday uh, again. A lot of people don't believe Marcus Eust is dead. Oh yeah, right. So yep. I just accepted that this guy had shot himself on the beach in Hermanus. People are saying, oh, it's chicken blood. Where's the funeral? Yeah. Um, because, of course, now everything gives rise to conspiracy theory. We discussed this the other day. Mm-hmm. Is, this, is this a widespread opinion that people think that he's not dead and that he's done a... Because also, they said this about old Gavin Watson. Mm-hmm. Remember? Mm. Now, I don't, I don't know if anyone spotted Gavin Watson around. I haven't. As far as I know, he's still dead. Yep. 
Um, and you would think by now, I mean, they, they spotted Tabo Besta and Nandi in Sanson <laughs> City. Uh, was Gavin in some tropical forest somewhere where no one will find him in Senegal or in Guatemala? Or, and if he is, he may as well be dead. That's some way to live. Mm. Where can you go in the world where you could be totally anonymous? I wonder. Uh, especially if you've been in the news. If you, yeah. You know, Marcus Euster was in international news. He was being prosecuted in Germany and in South Africa. So he couldn't really go to Europe. Mm. Uh, sure, money can buy you a lot of things, but it cannot buy you complete anonymity. Sure. The more you have, the less likely you are to be Im immune, uh, 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 anonymous um, and immune to prosecution. Unless you've got the kind of money where you could buy yourself an island. And but you even though, I mean, like uh, Epstein yourself. had an island. Mm -hmm. What happened well, to him? Yeah, well. Did he kill himself? Where is Epstein? Has anyone spotted see, him? See, that's another one. The thing is, I think the reason why people are coming up with these conspiracy theories is because there's a couple of people who died conveniently. Let me put it that way. Like, right when they were supposed to fall on their sword, mm. that's when they disappeared. I well, think it's the timing of everything yeah, but that's, this, that's, this, that makes this, it a bit questionable. This is, not, this is not a complicated one to me. He was about to go to jail for the rest of his life. Yes, sir. They were about to close in on him. Mm. It, it was like the, the day. They were, the Hawks were preparing, as far as I understand, that week to arrest him. Mm. So he was looking at the cards that he's been dealt, and he thought, hmm, I've, right. I've been a crooked son of a bitch, which he was. Mm -hmm. They're coming for me. There's no more hiding. I can't get away. I'm gonna. The only way out is the gun. Yeah. I'm gonna go down to the beach where I can have a nice view, blow my brains out. You know, it wouldn't be. Is that really so outlandish to most people? Not I mean, at all. Suicide is a big thing in this country for people who have far less problems than Marcus Euster. Mm. There are people who are dealing with, you know, a mm, a bill for like a their car repayments or something. Yeah. And they go, well, it's too much for me. I'm going to take my life. We, that happens every day. In this yes, it does. it does. There are people who, you know, their girlfriend breaks up with them and they go and mm. kill themselves. Or they find out they've been raising someone else's child. This happens. These it are does. serious things, but people kill themselves over unserious things. So you really think that Marcus Euster would have been one of the people at the list, the top of the list of unserious things. The, the thing he had is, serious, look, he had serious shit heading his way. Yes, he did. Um, and also by then, he's embarrassed his family. His kids must have been humiliated yeah. to say that that was their father. The wife wanted nothing to do with him. The girlfriend, by the way, she, the former lover, Berdine Udendahl, is trying to access money. <laughs> she didn't wait very long, did she? No, she didn't. She has applied for leave to appeal before the Supreme Court of Appeal after already losing two court bids. She wants the court to compel the central bank, that's the Reserve Bank, obviously, mm. to continue paying her 150,000 rand a month for living expenses from her blocked accounts. 150,000 rand a month. What, where does she live for 150,000 rand a month? Like, what, what, what is going on? I got to ask you, I know families of five and six, yeah. you know, Mom and dad and a whole bunch of kids, and they are able to live on a quarter of that. Yep. In fact, a fifth of that, mm -hmm. maybe even less. Mm. And they manage. So how is she what is she doing for 150 grand a Did month? That, like what what is she paying that's just for? Her, that's just her living expenses. Those are not oh. you know, over and above. So she's got a hell of a lifestyle anyway. She does. They've attached four of the bank accounts, including a net bank account belonging to her. Back in 2021, they raised some suspicion about a 60 million rand loan she had received from a horse racing company. <laughs> 60 million rand. That's not suspicious at all. From at a all. Horse racing company. <laughs> she was paid a series of monthly installments of 150,000 already. These payments for her living expenses ran from July 21 until March 22. Hmm. The Saab ceased payments when she demanded they also release funds to cover her legal costs labeling it a, a repu repudiation of the agreement. Uh, <laughs> poor her. I don't feel sorry for it all. Anyway, Not in the slightest. as I was saying, this guy didn't have a lot to live for. Yeah, I think, look, people look at all the elements that come together about this thing. Um, like, over the years, we've seen a lot of very wealthy people get away with a lot. So I can see why people might lend 
themselves to some of these conspiracies. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that it's anything it's like it, it's, it's true or whatever, but I can understand why someone might think to themselves, hey, you know what? Perhaps there is this little island where some of these scoundrels run off to, you know? And because we are so uh, prone to seeing evidence these days, someone was waiting for the picture to mm. trend of him with his head blown out. And then well, everyone will be like, yeah, there it is. We want the grisly autopsy details, yeah, yes, right? Yes, we do. We want all of that. We, we're not satisfied. Yep. And even then people will say it's staged. Because, mm. I mean, till this day, some people still believe that Tupac's still alive. So, of course. You know. And Elvis. Elvis and all of this other stuff. So, yeah, yeah, John you know. Lennon. Hey, man. Um, Congo Chris says, uh, talking about rules for thee and not for me, uh, Zuma's argument is that he only served three months of his 15-month sentence. Section 47 excludes anyone with more than a 12-month sentence from participating for five years. Here's so, the problem. The sentence, his sentence was 15 months. The right. fact that he served three does not change the mm, sentence. Interesting. That's a good, that's a very good distinction. Uh, Tracy says, this is what dictators do. They change the rules either to stay in or get to power. Classic Zuma, he killed the scorpions to save his own. Well, he did that. Mm -hmm. um, would love to know where this crook is getting money for all this bullshit fucking biggest thieves trying to run this country. Well, Darren, you, Daryl, you got to <laughs> calm down for starters. Yeah, that was uh, quite violent. I, I want to know, uh, James, our producer, showed me a picture of the biggest EFF billboard, and I drove through Alex yesterday. Mm. And there's, there's a mural of, okay. right near the Alex Mall mm. of Julius. But James sent me the biggest billboard on William Nick, well, near William Nickel on the highway. Okay. Huge big billboard of the for the EFF. They are spent whoever's paying for their campaign is spending big bucks. I'm I have seen a fortune of mm -hmm. EFF advertising, but we're talking they must have hundreds of millions of rands mm. to spend. And and I wonder who's giving it to them. It can't just be their cigarette. Friends. <laughs> yeah. Or is it? Possible. Possible. I, I always want to know. And you, you can tell these guys are spending, right? And you can see that they're, they're, not, they're not shy to spend money. Yeah, but wasn't it said that they have to tell us where they're getting this money? I could be wrong. They are meant to tell us where they're getting the money. But mm. I think they, they, you know, we'll only find out about this money in six to eight months or so. Yeah. So this is money that they're getting right now. Mm. They'll have to report to parliament what their funding is and all this sort of shit. But I am just blown away. So look here, this is, I mean, it's a terrible picture, but James was driving. That thing is really big. You that can't see big, it from yeah. the picture, but there's some, there's some big billboards all over this country at the moment. I've seen ANC ones, mm -hmm. EFF ones. Yep. I've seen a lot of Rizem Zanzi. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't seen a lot of others. Yeah. I saw I saw the Freights Front Plus. They've got a an electronic billboard in Midrand. I haven't seen one of those at all. Yeah, uh, and and it also whatever's being advertised in your neighborhood tells you a hell of a lot. Yeah, too, it right? does. It does. Because why would a party that has no chance in your neighborhood be advertising there if they didn't have a chance? Right. So you think you're in a neighborhood that votes a certain way? Meanwhile, mm. the the politicians have done their research. Yes, they have. They're going to try and and win in that neighborhood. It's yep. interesting. Yep, yep. All right. Uh, anyone hear that leaked clip of Gaten saying he wants to form a majority coalition with the ANC after these elections? He said so on the show. Gaten McKenzie has said, in no uncertain terms, on this show with us, he will ally with whoever he needs to in mm -hmm. order to achieve power. And to some people, that is the reason they won't vote for him. You see, this is why I don't understand why it became such a big hullabaloo because mm. it's like he said this on numerous occasions. Like, mm. he even said it on the burning platform, which was the first time I heard him say it. So it's like, why is this news? Or are we being distracted from something while something else happens? It's like, why? what are we talking about actually? It's, it's, it's so annoying to me how the most crucial news of the day is overlooked for something stupid like Gaten saying what Gaten has repeatedly said. Yeah, it's not. Is this is this it's really like, a surprise doing? to anybody? I'm not surprised at all. I, I'm never surprised by any politician who will do anything they can for power. Yeah. I think that's the business they're in. That's it. So 
uh, what, you suddenly want Mother Teresa to run for president? Oh, my goodness. What, you, you want the lady who runs the, the outreach program in, you know, the poorest township in South Africa, you think she's going to suddenly get up and decide to run for president? It's not going to happen. The kind of person who wants to be president has an ego which should immediately preclude them from being president. There you go. But you, that's not how it works. It's not. You know, people always go, ah, you know, a lot of CEOs are like, they're, they're monsters, they're, they're psychopaths, they, uh, they're narcissists. And I go, well, that's because the meek and mild shall not inherit the earth. Not, they won't. not while I'm around. I mean, as far as I can tell, uh, those people are doing great stuff sometimes, and sometimes they're doing nothing at all. Yep. But they're not going to put themselves out there to run for president because no, they not. don't they don't have the balls. They don't and, and it, it then begs the question when people make those kind of statements, it's like, do you understand what goes into being a CEO no. or what goes into being a president? No. Which is why like a couple of people uh were on my ass about how we treated Mpo last week Friday. I mean last week Tuesday. Yes, who was in the studio with us. Why were we horrible to him? Yeah. My friend we was were? like, you guys were horrible to him. Why would you do that? I'm like, dude, if he cannot handle two people in the studio, he shouldn't be running for president. It's that. And my friend was like, yeah, you guys went a little hard on him as far as the land question was uh, concerned. And I'm like, yeah, because he couldn't explain it simply. He hadn't thought about it at all. I don't think so. And, you know, my friend pointed out, look, dude, uh, Julius has already kind of covered the land issue. He's he's explained fact, it very articulately. Fact, and I was like, he's changing his position on land, uh, moderating it ever so slightly. That and nationalism, have you noticed? Yeah, I have. All I'm saying is, at the end of the day, if you cannot explain something simply, you just don't understand it. Yeah, you see, Arnold. Yeah, this is the kind of stupid that passes for thoughtful in this country. Arnold, I don't know you. You might be a very nice human being, but mm. uh, this is the dumbest comment I've heard in my life. The gift of the givers should run this country. I, I think well, because they're a that has to be sarcasm. That because they're a charity that is good at logistics and handing out you know, disaster relief. Now you what? You want them to run the country? I think you've confused, again, the kind of people who go into politics mm -hmm. and what politics is really about with what you wish it was about. Yeah. So that is... I mean, again, gift of the givers undeniably do some good stuff. Yes, they do. I'm a little suspicious of their motives in some respect, but I'm allowed to be. You could be suspicious about Marcus Houston, whether or not he's yeah, dead. Sure. Uh, that's just really fucking stupid. Um, there's also this comment from Juliana who says, I just some want someone to spray paint Rolex watches and VBS on the Julius posters. That'll be funny. <laughs> that, would that, be will, funny. that would be funny. That would be funny. Um, only those who do not crave power are qualified to wield it. That was Plato. That's according to Congo Chris. Very, very smart. Now, but can you imagine centuries ago this man said this? Yeah, he knew this was right. And we know it's right. But the kind of person who does not crave power is just not going to... This is a famous... Um, Roman general called Marius, mm. who was asked three times, like Christ was denied three times yeah, by yeah, Peter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was asked three times by the Roman Senate to help them during the Punic Wars, the wars against Carthage. He refused twice. The third time he eventually said, I got to do this for my country. Mm -hmm. And he did it. And then he immediately afterwards resigned yeah. from the, the dictatorial power that they'd given him. You know, Nelson Mandela was president for one term. One term. Handed over power. Mm -hmm. uh, whether or not he was reluctant to take that position, I don't think anyone would say he was. Mm -hmm. He knew he had a responsibility. Whether he thoroughly enjoyed the wielding of power, probably everybody who does in that position would. Yeah. But George Washington became president after fighting the War of Independence in America, first president of that country. Also, after his first term, Laid down power, said That's next. It. Who's next? Mm -hmm. It's a very, with the fact that I can name three people from history who did that means that it is rare. It is. If there were more people and you're welcome to bring them up in the comments, I'd love to see if you could think of any others. They don't exist. They really don't. I'm afraid they are very rare and very special people. It's not a likely scenario it really in, in modern politics. In fact, a lot of our politicians now are so <laughs> they're so blatantly looking for 
their egos to be soothed mm. by a by a popular vote. Yeah. And by being popular and by being performative. In other words, pretending to be a leader rather than mm. be a leader. Because mm. leaders sometimes say unpopular things yes. and take the consequences. Mm -hmm. Like they, they can see their popularity dropping, but they don't care because they feel they're doing the right thing. Yeah. Maybe they are, maybe they're not. Who knows? Uh, again, a rare thing to find. Very rare. I mean, even Uncle Posey said he would step down after one term, but there uh, he is. He's still there and he's still, still running. There. Mm -hmm. Still there. Mm -hmm. Just remember, make South Africa great again. And Slippery Pickle, while we're talking about ancient Rome, yeah. and then we will move on because we've got uh, Martin standing by to talk to us this morning. Slippery Pickle says, Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, had a servant in his chariot whose job it was to whisper in his ear, you are but a man. Mm. So that actually was true for everyone who rode in triumph in ancient Rome on the, the Via Sacra, which is the road that leads up to the Capitoline Hill where the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus was located. And they would ride on a, a two-wheeled chariot drawn by four horses, mm -hmm. and they would have a laurel wreath held above their head, a, yeah. a wreath of bay leaves. Mm. Um, and the person who was holding, the servant who held the, the bay, a slave usually, in fact, who held the bay leaf laurels above their head, would whisper in them, because now they have the adulation of the right. crowds, right. This is their moment of triumph. Mm -hmm. That's where the word triumph comes from. Mm. Triumphal arch is what they would ride under. Right. It was the greatest moment of public lording that anyone could wish for right and while this is happening the slave was required to keep whispering you're but a man you are but, you're a, but man. a man yep. you are nothing mm. you are nothing mm -hmm. this is what they would say to them it kind of feels like cersei in in game of thrones shame shame yeah there's a bit of that <laughs> yeah a little bit and and i think um we we need to bring that a little bit more not the slavery part but like <laughs> people being told that hey just remember, you are, you, you are just a man. You are but a man. That's why they end up in court fighting for whether or not they can run again. Um, <laughs> yeah. All right, it is time for the window seat with travel.co.za. Now, I've got to just remind everybody, one of the reasons we do this is because most of us are so busy. We plan one or two holidays a year, mm. and we don't really have the time to put in the effort, necessarily even have the money to be able to do it properly. We try to expose you to a lot of the thinking inside of the travel industry. Mm -hmm. We try to expose you to a lot of the places and the things that you could do to make that really worthwhile. And we're doing it with uh, Tourvest, of course, and in this case, Tourvest Destination Management, which is one of the divisions. And we're going to speak to the CEO there, Martin Wiest, who's going to help us out with a, a bunch of things. But I also want to talk to him because he's the kind of guy who really knows a lot about tourism and about travel. And these are the things we want to expose ourselves to yep. so that we don't make dumb decisions, so that we know a little bit, so that we seem like we can uh, spend our money better, figure out some of the hacks that make it easier for us to travel with ease. Yeah. So here he is. He is the CEO of Tourvest Destination Management, a member of the Tourvest Holding Executive Committee. He famously started his travel and tourism career as a driver. So you see... Here's a guy who is not afraid of uh, hard work, and here he is to join us this morning as the CEO. Martin, it's nice to see you. How are you? I'm very good. It's early in the morning, and it's raining and foggy where I am, but it's fantastic to be with you this morning. Thank you very much, and thank you for two things. Number one, to describe personalities of CEOs accurately, uh, and, and for the free history lesson for this morning. So thanks for both of those. Well, listen, I mean, it is true that, you, you know, a certain kind of person... Uh, is sometimes required to run things, and maybe they don't have all the qualities that uh, you know Mother Teresa would approve of. But they certainly aren't always an evil dictator either. It's yeah. it's people, it's managing people, and in a position like yours, it's also managing like a lot of expectations, pushing a business in a certain direction. That requires energy, and it's a difficult thing to do. And and tourism and travel, everybody thinks they know tourism and travel because they've been on a trip. But it's a bloody complicated industry. And when you get into the economics and you get into the people and you get into managing the, the, uh, the destinations as you do, it's a hard job. Yeah, and, it, and it's changing so rapidly. I mean, the arrival of the internet, I, I can't remember, 10, 15 years ago, and then with an accelerated impact in the tourism industry, it's changed our business dramatically. So the division I'm responsible for brings about... 300,000 tourists a year to Africa. We've got offices in seven countries on the African continent. <coughs> we run just over 300 vehicles all over Africa. 
And um, um, the internet has changed our business dramatically. Um, you know, Gareth, if last time you booked a holiday, the likelihood of you doing it on the internet is quite high. And what we have to do in, in the area that I'm responsible for is to convince our customer and to convince the consumer that actually dealing with human beings is still the better way of doing your travel than um, through a digital medium and a computer. And that's changed our life dramatically. It, it uh, forced us to reinvent ourselves as a business. It actually forced us to go deeper and deeper into more and more complex destinations. So the latest destinations we added to our portfolio has been, for example, Madagascar, um, with uh, Uganda, and we're busy with various countries in West Africa at the moment where even Gareth won't go and uh, go on um, a um, book, common book a day and he'll need somebody to hold his hand. And so complexity is our friend and service is our friend. And I think that's the, the important part here. So it's changed dramatically from the days where I was a bus driver. Thanks for reminding me of that. I, that uh, listen. Uh, there's nothing like an origin story, right? We mm. we want to know where Spider Man came from. We want to know if it, is it really true that you did start off as a bus driver? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I could add to that. Uh, I, I studied totally the wrong thing. I, I thought I was genetically made to become an electrical engineer because my dad was one, and uh, had a phenomenally poor uh, academic record. And when I dropped out of university, I needed uh, to take stock of what I knew, and I. I I'm German, so I speak fluent German, and I, um, I'm, I speak fluent French. Well, then at least I spoke fluent French. Um, and I knew the country quite well. So I, 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 for the first three years of my life a tourist, I physically drove buses and gave commentary and acted as a tour guide. That's bloody amazing. That is I, pretty I, amazing. You know, uh, these days everybody thinks that they've got a, a cool story, but if you to rise to the top of a, a, a massive business like Tourvest Destination Management, when you when you start off that way, it gives a lot of people hope. Uh, if you work hard, uh, they say you know you'll get ahead, and then you get those negative people who say no, no, no. There's there's always someone in the way making it impossible for you. You're like a living example of this. I mm -hmm. like it. Mm. Yeah, and uh, I, I think it's it's hard work. I think sometimes it's also a bit of luck involved. You've got to have people that support you in an organization. Um, but it's certainly time in the saddle and it's experience. But simultaneously, you've got to further your education. So <laughs> whilst my first attempt at tertiary education wasn't that great, at least I had a few more successful events in my life doing that. And I must tell you, the first three years in in, in a bus, was amongst my favorite years in the bus. I still have a guide license today. I still mm -hmm. have a I still have a public driving permit, and I still have a permit to drive buses. Uh, as a matter of fact, in 2010, when one of our drivers became ill during the FIFA World Cup project, uh, I drove that bus back from the stadium. So oh, I can. That happens that. very hard, man. That's awesome. I love it. So you can actually can be called on when there's uh, when there's bullshit going on. When they so should hand a little bit, yeah. What does TDM, Tour Best Destination Management, actually do? What, do you, what are you guys responsible for and, and what is your core business? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and summarize it briefly because it's quite complex. So firstly, we operate in Namibia and Botswana and South Africa, in Mozambique and Madagascar, in Zanzibar, in Kenya and Tanzania, Uganda and uh, soon in West Africa. So those are our areas of operations. Our key business, we've got two core businesses. The one is we call inbound leisure. So people coming inbound, our main markets are in Europe and the United States. Uh, we, as I said earlier on, do about between all those countries, uh, between three and 400,000 passengers a year. Uh, that are people from United States and Europe that are having a holiday in Europe. And we do for them whatever they require. So it's either creating a soft life itinerary um, with all the bookings that they need, uh, or we take them on one of our vehicles. And our vehicles are highly diverse. We're running these, I don't know if you've been to the Serengeti, we're running over 100 pop-up vehicles in the Serengeti. Um, we the pops up for photography. I don't know if you've seen our overland adventure trucks. They're called drifters. Mm -hmm. um, around Joburg, but I really run across Africa um, and you go camping across Africa. It's an amazing product. Um, we run a fleet of Quantums here and we take overseas tourists on tours through South Africa, uh, buses in Namibia, etc. So that's our one core business. The second core business is uh, 
Um, sports travel and tourist uh, is attached to tourist destination management. And we have two key businesses. The one is called Pure Travel, and we take South Africans skiing. Um, and uh, we take South Africans to Formula One, and we take South Africans to awesome. Wimbledon. Uh, and last but not least, uh, one of the businesses we're particularly proud of is SA Rugby Travel. It's a joint venture with Saru, and we do anything to do with the Springboks. So we do Cape Town Sevens. Uh, we took just over 5,000 people to France for the Rugby World Cup in France. We do stuff like that. So sports travel and inbound leisure is sort of my daily bread, and it's an amazing place to be. So apparently you've got this Indaba happening in uh, 2024. Where is that, and, and, and what does it involve? Who, who all goes to this thing? You know, guys, it's an interesting story. So this is my personal 34th Indaba. Um so Indaba is the is the travel show the travel show piece of South Africa, and of course it was invented in the mid eighties, very long before internet or mobile te 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 telephone was invented or any of that. So the only way that you could deal with your customer was around the table, which, by the way, I still much prefer than. And I'm really sad that I couldn't make it to the studio this morning because I prefer face to face. Hey, listen, this this um, rain you saved yourself some trouble. A hundred percent. But the so travel in Dubai has been around since the mid '80s, and it is in essence is supposed to put together distribution, product, and uh, customer from overseas. So the customers would be the wholesalers that put brochures together, put product of South Africa together. It happens in the second week of May. The first in Dubai that I attended. Believe it or not, was at the Riverside Holiday Inn in Van der Bell Park. There were six of us that in exhibited, and there was twenty buyers. So there was twenty six of us all together that fitted into the hotel. Um, I, I'm guessing with a number of exhibitors. My guess is we had, have somewhere between seven and eight thousand exhibitors now. We have between ten and fifteen thousand buyers now. So in Darba has come a very long way um, since uh, my very first one at the Holiday Inn in Van der Bell Park. Jeez, that's, an, that's an incredible story and shows you how things develop over time. And also you start off thinking, mm, this is very small. Mm. Before you know it, it's like become a massive, massive thing. Um, what is your forecast? Because it would be a waste of having you on and not asking you this. For the South African tourism industry in the next two years, there's obviously there's a lot of excitement around what South Africa can offer, what we already offer, what we have the potential to offer. Um, and there are people from all over the world who really love coming here, who've never been here before and want to come here. What do you think the, the overall forecast is? So, so maybe if I, if I frame it a little bit, I mean, South Africa, of course, sits in a competition with other African destinations and it sits in a competition with global destinations. Um, and a lot of your question to me hinges around how well we are promoting our country overseas how effective South African tourism is positioning our destination in the face of the consumer. Because at the end of the day, um, I can't do my job unless a consumer walks into a travel agency or a consumer goes into an online medium and specifically asks to travel to South Africa. Um, and for that, we need a, a very strong consumer drive, and that's the function of South African tourism, and it needs to function well. Mm. Um, the second component is, of course, comparative pricing. Uh, how competitive is South Africa as a destination? And so um, I guess over the last four or five years, and specifically since COVID, what has happened is on the African continent, so the African international traveler, the, the market share has shifted from south to east. Uh, so we've seen uh, substantial growth, particularly in Kenya and in Tanzania, and specifically in Tanzania. Um, because they had different COVID policies to South Africa. They, um, they uh, open, kept their tourism industry open during COVID. So we get on a clawback phase. This year we're growing back. We, as South Africa, we're not on 2019 level yet, whilst the balance, whilst East Africa specifically has exceeded 2019 levels. And we're fighting for our market share. So if you ask me, if South African tourism industry for the next two years, all things being equal, the rent stay, staying uh, weak, uh, South African tourism getting um, their, their marketing strategies right. 
my view is that by the end of 2025, we should be back at 2019 levels and then have gradual growth from there because excessive growth is impossible. We don't have the capacity in this country. Firstly, we don't have air capacity. I don't know if you've been on an aircraft lately. They're largely full. Yeah. Um, so a full aircraft doesn't allow for more tourists to come, so it doesn't allow for tourism growth. So we need more air capacity to South Africa. Um, we need more game launch activity. We are already now running into problems for winter 2025 where you can't find availability in game lodges. Really? Uh, we, we need more coaches. We need more tour guides. You can't find German-speaking tour guides. There's not a week that goes past to, to, to close the circle that I don't get a phone call from somebody that clearly doesn't know what I do for a living um, that doesn't want me to go and guide for them on a German-speaking tour, which I find always very humorous. Um, <laughs> And I'm always tempted to go on a nice German speaking tour. Well, um, uh, you've just, we need just to the, 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 the promotion and then we can outgrow where we are. But pardon me, Gareth. No, no, no. Uh, it, it, the, you've just told us about a, a huge gap. So if there's someone who really wants to get into tourism, just do a German course and you'll, you'll, you'll find a job easily. Or, or Italian, um, or any of the languages that, that uh, French, Italian, German would be a good departure point with a smithering of English thrown in. Very good. I love it. Listen, Martin, very good to have you on. And thank you very much for sharing some of your expertise and your, your experience with us. It's, um, it's really helpful to know these things. Also, for many of us who, who think that the, the, the tourism industry is so complicated. Uh, you helped to explain some of these nuances to us. Things like planes coming in, being full, and how we don't have capacity to grow exponentially. Uh, there are certain things that you've got to practically understand to know how much money the country can make out of tourism, and, and you've helped us understand that. Thank you. Yeah, and I think lastly, Mary, if I can say, tourism has got the cunning ability to create jobs in the right way. And I know that you've had conversations with Mornay, and Mornay's business is very different from TTS. It's very different insofar as the school centers are in the big cities. What, what uh, inbound leisure does, what tourist destination management does, that tourism happens in rural South Africa. It happens in the uh, in remote areas of South Africa. And hence, inbound tourism, and not only what tourists does, but what inbound tourism does, creates employment and creates job opportunities and creates entrepreneurial opportunities in rural South Africa and inadvertently reverses some of the urbanization that we have that can't be healthy for the country. So for many, many, many reasons, tourism is a fantastic industry for a country and should deserve a, a better focus than it currently gets. I like it. Thank you so much for helping us and, uh, and good luck to you and tourism uh, destination management at Tourvest. Very good. Thank you, Martin Wiest, the CEO this morning, our guest. All right, uh, we've got, Very we got uh, Lorenza Eckhart joining us just now. We're going to talk some politics, Democracy 101. I'm looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about the US and Americans staring at the sun. Yeah, going nuts uh, about the eclipse. You know, you'd think this is the first time a lot of these Americans have ever seen a solar eclipse. And sure, it's exciting and every one of them should be it's a hell of a lot better than focusing on the Kardashians. For sure. But honestly, guys, uh, I, if I have to see one more of the, the Americans I follow on social media <laughs> posting a picture of themselves staring up at the sun, I'm going to lose my mind. It's, Interestingly enough. Show us the sun. Show us with, with the, you know, the safety that we need to, because they're all wearing these funny goggles, and which yeah. you need. You don't look at the sun unless you're a moron. But to show us that. I don't want to see you... This reaction video thing has been taken completely out of control. Mm. But I don't care enough about any human being's reaction. I may follow eclipse, you yeah. for all kinds of stuff, mm -hmm. but I'm not interested in seeing you looking at the sun. N there is never a moment where watching you watching the sun is, is sufficiently yeah, interesting yeah. to me. Definitely. Uh, and I got a hundred of these pictures. Yeah. What's sure. interesting is, um, so... I heard this from Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. So apparently mm -hmm. when Christopher Columbus made it to the Americas uh, in a slick way to try to get uh, power over the people there because he understood how planets and all of that stuff works. He said, look, uh, give me all of your stuff or in the next two days, it'll go dark. It'll go dark. In the middle of the day. There you go. 
And by the way, their own leaders were doing this too. There's that brilliant Mel Gibson movie, um, Apocalypto. Yes, sir. Where they show the Aztecs in what would become Mexico City mm -hmm. performing a similar ritual and all the stupefied peasants. Right. This happened in Europe. It happened in India. It happened yeah. in America. Mm -hmm. It happened here in South Africa. Someone who knows that this is what happens when the earth passes in front of the sun. Or, or at when least the, the moon. Sorry, when the moon yeah. passes between the sun and the earth. There you go. If you could figure that out, if you know how celestial bodies operate, and there was a fair amount of this evidence. I mean, the Aztecs were astronomers. Mm -hmm. Ancient Egyptians were, were astronomers. astronomers. Yep. Ancient Indians were astronomers. The Dogon as well. All of those people. So yep. if you understood this, then the stupefied peasants would go, oh, there you go. Magic. Just like they think uh, Elvis is still alive. Right. Marcus Euster or that Jacob Zuma wasn't a criminal. And, you know, stupefied See, peasants are still a big part of the world today. Yeah. Th so the more things change, the more they stay the same. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll be back with Democracy 101. Another thing for stupefied peasants to talk about. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Democracy 101. This is our chance every week to catch up on some of the big issues uh, that affect us and our democracy ahead of the elections. Of course, it's just a little way away. Jack mm. keeps adjusting his make South Africa great again. Hat. It's Msaga. You, you love this, huh? Msaga. All you day, every this. day. And uh, in, in, in a lead up to the elections, <laughs> this was the best time to do it, right? Yeah. Just keep this in mind. When you go and vote, think, think this. Hey, just by the way, because um, your surname always leads to these discussions, someone brought up your uncle, Khalema Mutlante. Yeah, yes, sir. We were talking about people who gave up power. Mm. And Khalema Mutlante was asked to be president again, and he was like, nope. Yep. So he was also a good example. So 
Thank God. At least, your, at least your family has a good track record in See, this respect. Like, we, we oh, come yeah. from a good stock, Gareth. I keep telling you, it's a good stock. <laughs> All right. Well, this morning on Democracy 101, I'm thrilled to have uh, Lorenza Eckhart with us. Lorenza, it's a great pleasure to see you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Good, good morning. morning. Can this thing quickly? There we go. Got to shut up the echo. Is, Is it off? off? No. This is this thing. It's going to make me want to kill myself. <laughs> Yeah. There we are. All right. Very good. Much better. Um, so Lorenza, of course, has her own show called Lorenza Eckhart in Gesprek uh, on CakeNet, which actually my, my parents, I've got to give them credit for this. They introduced me to your show. Oh, is that right? It's an awesome show. Oh, please sign up to your parents for I, me. I, no, I will. But I'll, <laughs> I'll tell you what, it didn't take much to convince me to watch because you have fascinating guests. You have really relevant and useful insights. And I don't know about you, but I, I turn on the TV sometimes and I'm like, here's a political analyst, but I've never heard of them. They seem mm -hmm. to be springing up like flowers. Everywhere, yeah. Plucked from obscurity. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the, the thing about hosting a show like yours isn't necessarily about your opinions or analysis, but the people who come on the show. And you seem to bring some really smart, really thoughtful people in there who have interesting takes I'm not getting from anyone else. So well done. Thank you so much. I great show. That. We've got a good team. Yeah, uh, listen, I mean, that's such an important part of it. But mm -hmm. also, you, you seem to ask the right questions, which helps. Well, I am curious. Uh, so I yeah. think that's always a good yeah, it's foundation. A, it's a good sign, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, curious people Just tend asking to... questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, before we even get into any of this stuff, um, you've been a journalist for more than a decade. And you get to speak to these people. This is obviously the most important election we've had in a long time. Everybody's saying that. Yeah. What are the most interesting things you've picked up in the last little while on your show that, that have made you think, ooh, and I mean, apart from the MK thing, which is kind of a late entry mm. uh, that might have sh shaken up the odds a bit, there, there are a bunch of political analysts who are also rubbing their heads going, yeah. what the hell do we make of this? But what, what have you picked up? Well, that's been interesting, Gareth. And I think something that sort of stood out for me talking to the analysts and political parties is, you know, before previous elections, uh, you had that sort of line from the DA, the main opposition, like, let's not fragment the opposition, don't waste your vote on a smaller party. And I think this year, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a big change. It's been a mindset shift from many voters saying, well, perhaps we should accept as an electorate and as a country, we are a bit more diverse. And it's perhaps not the worst possible thing for me to look at a party that represent uh, my culture, my language, my religious preferences, my tribal preferences, etc. Mm. And I think previously it's been a bit of a dismissive attitude from the ANC and the DA, the big parties. I think this time around they've perhaps wisened to it to an extent. They're still sort of maybe from certain corners edging on voters to, to not do that, to not split the vote. But I don't see that strong message coming out and saying don't waste it on a smaller party. Uh, there's a pragmatic politics being sort of uh, exercised, I think, and we see that with a multi-party charter and the MK, as you say, that's sort of just, you know, the, the joker in the packet this year. Mm. Mm. Listen, I think that's a very apt description. Yeah, and, and I like what you're saying here because it also shows me that we're evolving as a democracy. Mm -hmm. Like there used to be this idea that you either vote for this party or for that one. And I know that there are countries like America where they only have this binary system. You have an option between the, the Republicans and the Democrats. Mm -hmm. But with us, you know, if you're a diverse country, you need diverse options. And my God, have you seen this ballot paper? <laughs> The longest one we've ever had. <laughs> but you know, look, look, I've, I've got no problem with people having diverse thoughts and all of this stuff, but 300 is a bit much. No, I mean, guys. obviously some of those parties, you, I've seen them for the first time when they <laughs> announced them last week at the IC and it, it's, it's actually, it, it's a joke. It um, is. So that's not good. So I'm not saying we need a million parties. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, last night I had Courtney Mulder of the Freedom Front Plus on the show with Gate McKenzie from the Patriotic Alliance. So they yeah. were reacting to John Stenhausen's message on the weekend mm -hmm. um, in oh, yes. Cape Town. Um, Just remind us what John said. Well, I mean, he was sort of campaigning in the Western Cape saying, don't, we can't trust these other parties. And the only reason that they are targeting the Western Cape is because there's nothing else to steal in the other provinces. Now, mm. I've got a big problem with this sort of negative scaremongering politics. Yeah. And it's not something that you hear from Ellen 
Wayne Windy, the Premier of the Western Cape, by the way, when when I speak to him about these issues, he, he doesn't have this sort of finger wagging of um, don't take good governance for granted and if you don't vote for us, we'll get the ANC, FFPA, whatever the, mm. the doomsday scenario is. You know, he's very happy to focus on the successes of the DA and the Western Cape government. Um, and I think that's that's much smarter. To, to, it's, a, it's a better way to, to speak to, to the electorate. Now, after the show, uh, one of my team members made the comment that he he really enjoyed what Cornel Mulder and Gator McKenzie said, and it was interesting for him, these two diverse politicians on the same panel willing to talk about these issues, um, and he wishes that they could be on the same ticket or on the same party, oh, but yeah. that would be a problem, right? It's great that you had them both on the show because I've actually sat in a place where both of them were present. They actually get along quite well. Yeah. They don't necessarily agree on everything, but they are civil with each other, and there are area, huge areas of overlap. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. Um, it's interesting that both of those guys represent probably very small parties, mm. um, but but parties that are that know what they're about, mm. right? Where, Strong you know, the, identity. The mm. big ones, the broad churches, as they, the ANCs called themselves, and the DA likes to p- pretend that it is. These, these parties just, I think a lot of people have also given them a chance for 30 years, and it's like, well, what uh, now? There's, there's some fruit there for the DA in the Western Cape. The ANC lived for a long time on that liberation message. But maybe we want to try new things. There's, there's def- definitely a, um, a yearning for something different. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I think the other thing is just if these two men were on the same, were in the same party, then you would have the perhaps internal fighting that we see in these broad church movements. I mean, obviously, it's problematic if you have these sort of leader, strong leader-driven parties. It's only built around a single individual. Sure. Um, but what we are able to do in this election, I think, and this is what I alluded to earlier, is that you have party leaders or parties saying, I'm going to bring this section of the electorate and I'm going to bring this section out. Together, they might not vote for a party that both of these leaders, if they were in the same movement, but now we can say, well, this is a like the PA, a, a, a predominantly uh, brown-colored party, and mm. the Freedom Front Plus, Afrikaans, white party predominantly. Well, it's interesting. They do have a lot of brown support in the Western Cape. Yeah. But to say that we're going to bring these people to the table and now we're going to have a discussion and I'm going to make sure that my my voters, that their needs are met if we are going to any negotiation scenario. And so it's, it's very uncertain. Uh, I think we're on very shaky ground, but it's exciting. And I think that we should embrace this and I think it's very... Um, I think it's problematic that, as you said earlier, the, the broad church parties are sort of dismissing this out of hand or making the Hillary Clinton argument of the basket, basket of deplorables. deplorables. Mm-hmm. So that's an interesting uh, thought, and I want to hear what you think of this. But um, one of the biggest missteps I think that the DA has made is that they said there are certain parties they won't work with, which is like, you, you know, you're counting yourself out. Politics is really about the art of the possible if you are one of those kind of people or it's just pure pragmatism if you're one of the more Gate and McKenzie Cornet Mulder type of people either way to say that you won't work with X or Y because of some legacy thing mm. the average voter is really not interested in that most voters are not particularly turned on by ideology or by principle even I mean to look for principle with politicians is like you know it's like <laughs> yeah. you're looking for health in a hospital yeah it's like a very bad idea mm-hmm. it's not sanitary yeah um do you think that that they've all made as glaring an error as that? I mean, the ANC's errors, obviously, they mount every day. And the speaker situation mm. last week has got to also, <laughs> just from a reputational point of view, this is mean, not helpful. Like, not in the slightest. Right. And and it it's like the, 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 they've muddied the water so much that I don't think there's a single individual in this country that can't list the problems that we have. <laughs> like... I think you'd be an idiot not to, yeah. which actually leads me to my question being, do you think that these opposition parties have uh, missed the opportunity to get their messaging across in such a way that the electorate would be willing to hear them? Because I still feel like the NC still has some sort of, uh, or a 
bit of the share of the bandwidth in terms of the messaging out there. Absolutely. I, I think, and, and listen, just to be clear, I'm not endorsing any party. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think what's interesting with the, in the ANC scenario, um, and we see this with the messaging from the DA, and as John Sienos mentioned this weekend, I don't know who's advising him on taking that route, um, but the sort of scaremongering, finger wagging, you know, it's 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 not it's not different to the ANC sort of very subtly. Uh, messaging or you won't get your grant. exactly. Mm-hmm. I think it's exactly the same thing, and mm. I think it's so patronising to the voters. Yeah, but for the opposition parties to just stand up and say, "Well, at least we're not the ANC," um, you know, lame. I think that's lame. It's I think it is. It's, yeah. it is. It's, Lazy. It's, it's really, as we say, Afrikaans. It's this for building, Lewis. Mm. Um, give me a better message. Don't yeah. just tell me why you're not the abusive husband. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right. I mean, it's like the land of the blind, the one-eyed is king. Exactly. And we have come to expect so so little from our politicians. I mean, I, I, again, we do have, and this is where I feel like there is an unfair double standard that we have. We judge all the opposition parties much more harshly than we do the ANC. We're always so, so impressed when the ANC is like that mom in the clumps. Mm. Hercules, Hercules, Hercules. <laughs> yeah. When the ANC get the smallest thing right, yeah. like they open that tap in Pumalanga somewhere. We're mm. like, wow, they did this. Because mm. where it's like watching a special needs kid yeah. finally be able to tie his own shoelaces. The mm-hmm. ANC. Um, Carl says, Gareth, if you're making a genuine comparison between the ANC and the EFF, you must have shit for brains. Well, listen, <laughs> all I'm saying is that to exclude parties who are going to get in the case of all three of the big parties, over 10% Mm. of the vote means you are making a decision that you can't be sure is the right one ahead of time Mm -hmm. when there could be reasons that you have to come together. The people of this country are not going to vote all overwhelmingly for one or the other. This is going to be one of those split elections. Coalitions are going to be part of it. So keep your options open if you're a party. Right. Be practical about it. You never, you never know what's going to happen. You might have to be awkward bedfellows with someone yeah. at some point and make compromises. And ideologically speaking, a lot of these parties aren't that different, if we're being honest. Well, about that. No, I mean, honestly, I, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that South Africa is more invested in personality politics rather than policy. I think, and, I think to be fair, Jack, like the, the Freight Front and Patriotic Alliance do not have a lot of common ground with the EFF or MK, ideologically. Sure, sure. But I mean, that's, that's we're agree? talking about. I agree. Uh, we, that, those are some of the high level parties. I'm talking about with the parties that make up this long 300 list. Like, oh. yeah. a lot of them could disappear if they would just oh, yeah. were to have. A little meeting. What like, you mean? Well, you, down, you mean you're not voting for the Dikwan Kwetla Workers Party? <laughs> no, <laughs> all the Dafa Party. Maybe well, as Jack, much as I love that. Maybe something that you made me think of this now is you know with these manifesto launches that we've seen the season of the manifesto launches. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know any voter who's actually read the manifesto. Now we report on this and we sort of give a summary of of the party's big policy points. But I don't know if you've just polled the average voter on the street and you say identify the three biggest policy differences between the EFF, the mm-hmm. AC, the DA, the PA, VF Plus, ACDP. Hey, you did this on your show. <laughs> this, is, this was very, I watched that this week. Okay. Um, and, and not in preparation for you coming in because I wasn't even sure if you're going to be able to make it this morning, but you did some really useful infographics where you broke down mm. the position of all of these parties. Well, not it's all important of them, to the, be the educated. So mm. that's our role is to yeah. do that, to educate the voters. Um, but I do think that it is more personality driven and we've got everyone's on social media and the smart political leaders have a way of exploiting that. And it's not just the, the bar being low for the ANC. I mean, you spoke about the EFF earlier. I mean, Julius Malema has flip flopped on just about any issue that we can discuss over the past decade. (laughs) Um, but he's got a core set of, of supporters and voters that are not going to turn their back on him regardless of what he says, because he represents something bigger to mm, them. Mm. Um, and for us to just dismiss that out of hand, I think it's a mistake that the ANC have made, just to come back to the basket of deplorables thing. I think our saving grace as a country is because of the fragmentation, all of these deplorables that the parties have sort of excommunicated, you know, if you look at the MK, they go into different corners. There's not one big movement where they can coalesce, as we've seen in the US following... Well, Donald Trump's rise. that's an interesting question because there were concerns some time ago. We've had a lot of IEC people on the show mm. in the same chair that you're sitting in now. And I have, uh, I'm, I'm 
fairly, fairly confident that the IEC know what they're doing. They Absolutely. seem to be yeah. peopled by some very competent, uh, very smart, very well-meaning, and from my point of view, completely incorruptible people mm. as, as far as that's possible in the world. But I think these are people who take their job very seriously. And the IEC, as far as I'm concerned, has allayed any fears I had of that. Will, in your opinion, any of the parties get in the way of the democratic process? You know, we have the Americans on both sides, mm. Democrats and Republicans are alleging that the other is trying to sabotage Stop democracy. The steel and- yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> uh, you know, democracy is not the, the sacred thing which you dare not criticize. Meanwhile, it's just a very clunky system, maybe the best of all the bad ones, yeah. mm-hmm. but a clunky system which we use to elect leaders. It's imperfect. The IEC is going to do a reasonable job. Do you think there are any parties who will actively stand in the way of the vote that will actively go against the principles that we've established now and for 30 years have been mostly practicing in this country? Well, I think we have this conversation before most elections. I mean, I remember the previous few national elections. There was this concern, especially when the EFF came in, you know, are they going to accept the outcome? But I think what's interesting is uh, all of these parties are so optimistic. Um, you know, all of them will tell you. They're all we, telling you they're going to they're get, get the outright majority. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> you know, before the vote and even perhaps on the day, they'll be optimistic and think that, yeah. you know, their voters will turn out. And I think it's much more difficult to sort of cast aspersions on the election mm. following the fact. And then the IEC can come out and say, but this and this and this and this and happened because we haven't had any. Um, examples in the past of, of of parties sort of getting in the way of stopping people from getting to the ballot. Now, I mean, that's blatant um, election meddling. Sure. We might see subtler forms of that. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, someone in, in, in a rural village or so going in and saying, but don't do this, don't do that. But I mean, that's, that's, that, that won't be the fault of the IEC. That's just would sure. be a symptom of our politics. So I don't think that we're going to see massive voter disruption um but again obviously the police they've got a big role to play and the political parties as well to urge their supporters and their voters to respect the democratic process um and then yeah as i said i think following the fact it'd be much more a, a bigger challenge to say well it wasn't a fair election mm. so in the in the first hour of the show we were discussing mk's case in oh, yeah. Uh, wh- what Which do you one? make of it? <laughs> well, I mean, well, I mean, Jacob Zuma is <laughs> not being able to be on the ballot, essentially. Um, what do you make of that? Are they just genu- Are they genuinely trying to get Jacob Zuma back into the presidency? Or is this just some form of a power play that some of us aren't smart enough, I guess, mm. to see through? Well, I think it's interesting. If anything, it gives us an insight, uh, even even more detailed into to the man into Jacob Zuma I mean he mm. said that he was recalled he how much more finish. do we need to know about this man I mean we know about his <laughs> sex life we know about it. Yeah, yeah. everything right <laughs> mm. um but I mean he did say he was recalled he didn't finish his term he needs to be able to go and finish what he started I mean mm. and that's very scary and some mm. of the other comments that he's made of maybe suspending the constitution, coming out against gay marriage, you know, all of these, I mean, that's a very sort of uh, blatant dog whistling to conservative part of the electorate. And, mm. and okay, that's that's perhaps what, you know, is his true colors coming out. And maybe it was tempered within the ANC by more measured forces to say, don't, let's not go down that route. Mm. But I think if, if we're talking about election meddling or disruption, we might see that from from the MK if if they don't get uh, their way. And and he's done this before. I mean, let's just think back to the rights of July 2021. Mm-hmm. But I think the issues are different. We are a different country today, I think, than we were back then. Um, so, so to say that we're going to see, you know, 2021 2.0, I don't mm. think that that's – I'm not saying that we, we are going to see that. I'm not very concerned, too concerned about that. Mm-hmm. Um, but, I mean, it is – it's it's fascinating it what is. sort of what sort of feedback do you get from your audience? Um, because again, people would assume well, it's, it's Afrikaans, but they would assume it's white, it's certain age group. But I'm I'm pretty sure you also have a very mixed and interesting diversity of of audience feedback. Um, what do they say about some of the things that have been revealed on your show by these politicians, by some of the analysis that's been given by people who 
are well placed to be able to call things. And you know, there's so much polling. Mm. Mm. So, and and how much of this polling do we take seriously? Yeah. How much of it must we discard? Uh, every party will tell you the polls are absolutely trustworthy if it seems to be good for them. Mm -hmm. But the moment the polling turns against them, then, oh, no, we must just ignore this. Yeah. It's nonsense. No, it's it's interesting. I think as journalists and any social gathering I go to, the first question is always, is what's going to happen? What's going to happen? You know, will you they must now look, you read I the tea leaves. Yeah, yeah. the tea leaves. And, I mean, it's 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 um, it's a, it's a privilege to be trusted with that kind of insight, but I can't predict the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm at the end of Damn, I wish okay, I could. Well, that's the end of the show. <laughs> Let's wrap it up, everybody. We might as well pack up right now. It's been lots of fun, Lorenzo. Thanks so <laughs> yeah. much. Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> False advertising. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> no, I just it's 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 um, I just think I'm always sort of struck by how invested people are in this country, and I think it's so. These questions, I think, the foundation of that is. I mean, because we are all in South Africa, we don't. I don't have any plans of of leaving. Oh no! And mm. my viewers feel the same way. What, yeah. did, uh, what did Charlton Heston say when they said they were going to take away his gun out of my cold, cold dead, dead hands? <laughs> Absolutely, do the same yeah. to us. And so that it gives me so much hope when people engage with the politics because it means they care and mm. they care about this country. Um, and it's not. I mean, obviously, we all, we've just spoken about how diverse we are. And my viewers are not afraid to sort of say, I feel strongly about this. And there are certain golden threads that weave through the feedback that we get. But I just think it's fantastic. And it gives me so much hope that they that they engage and they, they give feedback. And it's very honest. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, uh, I, th I think just to come back to personalities, the reaction that we've always gotten from Having Gaten McKenzie on the show is people always just uh, he's, he's, he's got charisma. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. He, mm. Everybody's saying this, whether or not they'll vote for him or not. Separate matter. A lot of people say, "Oh, he's just a gangster." I think that's very dismissive and rude. But he's made a hell that of a lot. He's full of gangsters, by the way. Of course, <laughs> he's made a huge impact in a very short space mm. of time, and he speaks like someone who means what he says. Mm. And we're so sick of performative politicians mm. too. That's know? what it is. Have you at all, because we do a similar sort of show here, um, it's sometimes difficult to get some of the parties to come to the party. Absolutely. Mm. Um, and who, some of them refuse to be on yeah. a panel with some of the other party right. members. Right. So okay. well, we won't mention I, 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 any I names, want a but... little bit of insight from you as to who you're struggling to get into studio. Who thinks that they don't need you? Because that might be the reason. Mm. Like, why should we go on Lorenzo or Gareth's Absolutely. show? A lot of them, I can understand. Mm. Some of them might look at us and go, who the fuck cares what they say? Yeah. Um, are we allowed to swear? Yeah, you can yeah. say whatever you like. <laughs> okay. This is the, you do yeah. whatever you want here. Your parents are not tuned in. Uh, they, they are. <laughs> they must deal with it. Um, and then there are the ones who maybe just can't get the act together. They're just badly managed. Sometimes it takes you so long to get them that your producers eventually go, well, it's not worth it. Yeah. yeah. So we've tried with every, we've got every party leader in here so far, except for the Freedom Front Plus leader, we, we, we're going to get him. Uh, he's on the agenda. Songhezo Zibi is also coming in before the elections. But then it's the DA, ANC, EFF. Mm. Obviously, they're the big parties. They're busy. They have to choose very carefully where they position themselves. This is like an ad for them. If they're prepared to buy a big billboard, yeah. mm. this is an opportunity for them to state their case. And in many of these people's situations, I'm, I'm not a stranger to them. I've met them before. Mm. They've spoken to me before. We've had friendly interactions I, with all three of the leaders of those parties. I get the feeling the ANC just is doing what Joe Biden did in 2000 and just hanging out in the basement. Yeah. Hoping mm. that by saying nothing, people will forget all the terrible stuff and go with their feelings and emotions and vote for them because they, you know, brought about freedom 30 years ago. Yep. But the EFF and the DA have got to pull their socks up because they could be in trouble, both of them. No, I mean, I, I agree. Um, we, and it's 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 well known that President Cyril Ramaphosa very rarely, rarely does an interview. I think if he does one big sit down before the election, I'll be very surprised. Mm -hmm. He does a few sort of <laughs> speaking to the media following an event here, but it's always what's very... The, what's the benefit? Exactly. How's he going to win? It's yeah. not like any question he's going to get, he's going to be able to say, oh, we did this, we that right so i mean you, you can understand the the strategy <laughs> by the party to perhaps shield him from difficult questions mm -hmm. um but yeah we are struggling to to get the eff as well we're working very hard but that, i mean again it's a political calculation they perhaps feel like 
none of their supporters or voters are tuned into my show. Um, but we are pushing, so perhaps soon we'll have Julius Malema in the studio or at least a, a sit down. I'm, I'm do you also that. hear from people in the know? Because there are obviously people who know a lot more than we do. Uh, that they're also they've the internal reactions. I mean, we saw some of these things with uh, who was the um, the, the the woman who had the big fight with him, and now she's been put at like yeah. number two hundred on the list. And you know, we see these uh, schisms developing mm. between him and Floyd. Yeah. And he mm -hmm. was recalled from KZN as the you know the party campaign leader there. But I was saying, if if they get their way, he must be finance he has to be minister. Finance minister. <laughs> Although, by the way, and, and I think it bears saying, there were two or three things in their point of view about Floyd being finance minister and in their economic plan, which even the most conservative capitalist would regard as being pretty good ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, things like re-industrializing mm -hmm. South Africa, spending money on infrastructure, mm -hmm. factories. They were talking about tax breaks and special eco economic, economic zones. zones yeah. These are important things that you would never have heard from the EFF from 10 years ago when they started. But again, I think it's the flip-flopping. Yeah. Um, and it's so opportunistic and the message changes with every election cycle. You um, don't believe any of it. I don't believe any of that. And I think it's for me... <laughs> That's why we've got you here. I love it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I can say this here. Uh, but for me, I think the, the EFF has been hesitant to sort of put their hands up for any leadership positions in councils and... Um, uh, you know, they, they they don't want to be the mayor where they are. Because then they'll be measured. Exactly. Mm. So why did you not allow South Africans to measure you since you've been in power? I mean, I remember following the local government elections, uh, you know, with in, in, in Johannesburg, it was Michelle by then from the DA um, mm -hmm. and Malema sort of speaking to the media saying so there's no formal coalition, but they've got an agreement, the DA, EFF working together. I mean, we know... Uh, where Johannesburg is today, um, but yeah, just put your hand up and 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 get your hands dirty uh, in in those roles. But it's hard work, um, and I think that's another thing. And to give credit to the DA in the Western Cape, they've got a fantastically well-oiled machine of of party members, um, mm -hmm. officials that are well trained. They've got a very strict internal selection process, and when they are deployed. They know what they're doing. Um, so that's one thing you have to give to the DA, where they have sure. sort of gotten the, the majority of the support or be able to form a, a government or council. Mm. They do get in there and they do get their hands dirty. You know, a lot has been said about, <clears throat> excuse me, voter apathy. Um, do you think it's just a lot of uh, South Africans who've looked at politics in this country and just think to this, you know what, I might as well not get involved because half of these people are lying anyway? Or is it people actually recognizing that a lot of these people don't really bring much to the table? It's, it's such a difficult question, and I grapple with that so much. And it's not just youth voter ap apathy, it's Across all age groups, yeah. I think there are certain age groups that are more likely to vote, and we do have data on that, and I'm not smart enough to go into the, the numbers. But I do think that there is a lack of a, a, a hopefulness that we see in the messaging from certain parties, a lot of fear-mongering from all of them. And I just think that's not the way to energize um, a base or an electorate. Um, mm. And I don't think we are going to see that in the lead-up to the election. I think you know, the, the the big parties will turn out their bases. They'll do the big squeeze in the week before the election and we'll see a lot of the same patterns. But I think just in terms of ANC support, I don't think we're going to see enough ANC voters that are willing to go to another party. We do see that with the MK, but we will see a lot of stay away. So in other words, if, if a lot of people stay at home, that will be the benefit of the opposition parties? I think so. And not to the benefit of the ANC? I, I suspect we'll see that. Okay. It all depends on insight. on the day again. Yeah. We're mm. not, um, we don't have a crystal ball, but I think that's that's what we'll see. Well, yeah. the, the, the IEC is making quite a lot of noise about the fact that we've got 27 million registered voters now, and, and that's a new record. If everybody who registered goes to vote, which mm. obviously they won't, but if a close proximity of that gets there, then it would be the biggest election we've ever had. Do you think people are motivated in certain respects? I mean, the things things are pretty tough here. I think so. Go the economy's on. tough. The electricity situation mm -hmm. bothers people. I mean, God, 
Jack was telling me this morning, they were talking about stage 16. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even, uh, listen, the, the, I know that numbers are infinite, mm. but I didn't know that ESCOM's incompetence <laughs> like, was. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in, in their defense, it's stage 16 doesn't bring us closer to a blackout. It takes <laughs> us farther away because it sort of built in a bit of a safety net. <laughs> Someone explain this. Are you trying to be optimistic? Or are you just explaining explaining that they can insert any number of numbers? This is a dark cloud and I will find that silver lining. That is my disposition. So, I mean, we've got things like the electricity problem, the overall economy problem, crime, immigration Mm -hmm. is an issue in this country because we've got a lot of illegal immigrants who are competing with local people for jobs. Um, There are, you know, porous borders which bring in all kinds of other problems. And we also have uh, a couple of kind of down the line issues that people are worried about, but that should be probably bigger. Breakdown of families, mm-hmm. but a drug issue in this country and poor neighborhoods with tick and all this kind of thing. And I don't know whether parties can hide away anymore or whether voters mm. can, with good conscience, stay away from their responsibilities. I get so upset when we have these you know, 16 days or whatever the days are for activism and the mm. president coming out and saying all men should take a pledge um, to to not, to, you know, to, to stay away from gender-based violence. It's so problematic because the socioeconomic issues are so massive and that's what sort of gives rise to these, all of these issues that you've uh, mentioned, Gareth. And I think, yeah, the, the parties have a responsibility to to sort of be an alternative, to have an alternate vision for mm. where we can be as a country but all of that is to the is 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 because of the ANC i mean they are the ruling party um it's so interesting i had Pule Mabe on my show a few years ago um and i mean they were denying that load shedding was because of ANC failure <laughs> it was escom and this board member and these appointments. So there's, there's, I don't think we're, we're ever going to see accountability, but this is the fault of the ANC. And if sure. South Africa wants change, then they, the voters really need to think carefully about whether this party deserves to be trusted again. Now, I'm not telling anyone how to vote, but these are the things that we need to think about when we stand in that voting booth on election day. Yeah, and we were talking about the speaker just now. Um, there's so many other things that need to be fixed, um, the National Prosecuting Authority. And, and you know, I keep speaking to people I know inside of the criminal justice system who tell me, no, no, things just happen mm. slowly, but they are happening. Wheels of justice are turning. And slowly. there are going to be some mm. big arrests made. And obviously, I hear that all the time. But the speaker is a fairly big na- name. Mm. And, and, and this is a big story, and it should be. Mm. The, the, you know, in terms of our constitution, they are the, the head of the legislative branch. So this is not a small fry person. Mm. Um, it's one of the the top three in those three branches of government. And it does indicate that there is some movement. Obviously, it has to result in a conviction. The case has to be argued properly. They have to have their facts in order. One would hope that the NPA has. But in general, you get this feeling in this country, and I'm sure your viewers express the same frustration, that there isn't accountability for anything. Big business, you hear about people like Marcus Uester. Mm-hmm. He just takes his own life and takes himself out of the equation. But all the people who lost all their money in Steinhoff are stuck with the result. VBS, you know, we can count any number of these, the water situation, the power situation. Mm-hmm. There, are, there, are so, there are so many stories where people, we know who's responsible. Mm. Even in the, 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 I mean, all the commissions that we have, these endless state capture commissions oh. and Commission's been inquiry into this and that, but no people in orange uniforms. This frustrates people too. I think if there were a party that just, and maybe it is the Yate McKenzie's who say that they're going to stand up, the Freights from Plus is also saying the corruption and that is our biggest issue to tackle. Maybe if they put people in jail, mm-hmm. if they can show that that is their main thrust and they can actually put more judges in, re uh, stock and 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 give more more resources to the NPA. Maybe we'll see people get excited about that stuff again. I think that's a frustration that that people had just at the beginning of Sir Ramaphosa's term. We want to see big things happening very quickly. Now, to mm. his credit, he did do a lot to sort of um, 
restock the MPA. Um, we, I think we would have been much worse off if Sean Abrams was still the head of that institution. <laughs> but South Africans should also understand, and this is, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic thing. It's a great um, sort of, you know, symptom or, or aspect of our constitution is that you, you can't have political meddling. Ramaphosa, president of the country, South Africa, can't just tell the police who to arrest and who to prosecute. Sure. So that's a good thing. Yeah. It protects everyone. But I think it's interesting because we see reaction on social media following the shooting in Marion Hill last week mm -hmm. of that gang and the terrorizing the community. A lot of people on social media are saying, great, that's fantastic. Just shoot these bastards. Mm -hmm. And then we've got here and there a few people saying, but why well, it does seem a bit, you know, we, we can't have a situation where we have these extrajudicial killings and they should have been arrested, taken to court. But how many times do we hear people just being given bail, going out and doing the same thing. So communities are so fed up. And again, I think that was just such an interesting litmus test of where we are as a country mm. um, following the sh that shooting last week. But yeah, Gareth, I mean, hearing you rattle off all the issues, um, <laughs> I don't know. It's a... Uh, it's, it's difficult. Because, I mean, when you think about it on a day-to-day -day basis, I mean, they were asking Julius Malema how much the price of bread is. Oh, that and was he a didn't great interview. Like that. I mean, wow. so the i think the political um class in this country or the ruling class um are out so out of touch like the disconnect between where the majority of us live and where they live is so the gap is so wide mm. that i'm of, uh, i'm honestly of the thought that perhaps we just should just like slash their salaries like oh that would be a good like, start i think that but could lead okay. to yeah, you just you mentioned Sean Abrams now, and I'd completely forgotten about him. And then I saw on the MK list Des Van Royen, yes. and I'd mm. forgotten about him too. And we have made a, a fair amount of progress. I wouldn't say that we can go and you know all cheer Cyril on for the rest of the year, mm. but there are some things that are happening uh, by hook or by crook, and maybe they're just slow processes. That's like a drip, 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 and you have to wait eventually that you know stops feeling like Chinese water torture and oh. starts filling a dam, but. You're right, Jack. It's like uh, these guys are out of touch. And maybe things like putting the speaker in the dock, which mm. is a fairly scary thing for politicians. They haven't seen that for a while in this country. Maybe seeing the Speaker of Parliament and a former minister in the dock in court being given bail. Mm. Maybe that just sends a couple of shockwaves through and we need a few more things like but that. Just on the point of being out of touch, I mean, one of the reasons why she said that she should be granted bail was because of the unhygienic situation. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. She was overcrowded. former correctional it, service it, minister. Which was like, wow. Like you didn't have any role in where our prisons are at the moment <laughs> or the, you know, there's, there's no one here you could have had to just have a little cabinet discussion uh -uh. even when you were uh. not minister to say, listen, we need to sort this out. Let's look at the prison system. I mean, that just, it, it boggles my mind. And, yeah, and and she's not a person who would survive in prison. She, you know, prison's too terrible for her. But for the rest of <laughs> yeah, you, it's yeah, fine. Yeah. And those in prison, you know. Yeah, yeah and I mean, like, like, you know, justice needs to be seen to be done, right? Yeah. Which is one of the major problems. I, we I haven't seen that. We haven't seen it in this country. Um, even uh, cases, Jacob Zuma's corruption case hasn't even properly started. <laughs> Can you our, believe our that? Our courts are struggling to keep up. That's the reality. The question then becomes whose whose responsibility is it? I don't think to say that it's the courts that are taking forever to get this done, I think is uh, not looking at this thing in its totality. Like I, it's not it's not beyond me to think that these people know the ins and outs of the law so much that they know how to delay you know, so you justice think it, being done. So in other words, do not ascribe to uh, incompetence and, and malice what you, what, sorry, to malice what is just incompetence. incompetence. Yeah, it is. How about this though? There's a potentially another division in South Africa that, that we should take a little more seriously. There are those people who think that the state should be capable. There, there are people who believe that if we just had competent, able, merit-based selection of mm bureaucrats away from the cater deployment committee sure yeah that everything would get better we'd find people who could do all the the jobs that we require a government to do very well and then there are the people who go actually it's perfect that government is incompetent actually it allows the individual the greatest amount of autonomy 
they can possibly have. If you look at Europe and how absolutely overweening that bureaucracy is, if you look at America, which is a a, a republic or empire, depending on your point of view, in decline, where the, the bureaucracy has become so overmighty that it is now called the deep state by conspiracy theorists. <laughs> but but where essentially Americans and the Chinese, obviously, we can't move without people seeing every aspect of what you do. Sure, you scary. cross the street and they're here. It's the Wild West. Mm, it is. And uh, this is something that's come up on the show before. It's not something that you're completely uh, Im immune to having heard. Yeah. But I think in some ways you can celebrate the fact that if you're capable and you're able to make yourself as independent as possible of the state, mm -hmm. this can be paradise. I agree. And I think we see this with the unemployment statistics. I mean, if we look at that official number, it... I mean, again, it's we talk about these numbers and it boggles the mind, but you would think that we would have uh, July 2021 every month, just riots, about giving riots, yeah. food riots, all of that. But the reason we don't is because a lot of these people are hustling and they are earning a proper and decent living in an informal economy, yeah. away mm. from bureaucracy, away from applying for a license. Or this and away and from that. taxes. Away mm. from taxes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about the cashless push, but... And I think it builds a fantastic resilience um, that we as uh, South Africans have shown. But I think there's also a big part of the electorate who are properly hotful. Uh -huh. So we've suffered for a long time. Just give us a break. Mm. But that break is not going to come. I hate to break it to anyone and oh. to play spoiler. It's not going to come. If you want to make it in this country, you need to be resilient. You need to be resourceful. And, and you the can't last thing for... you can rely on is the government. But I will say this, Gareth. Um, it's an interesting sort of discussion you know to what extent should the state I, obviously it's a an age the, the mm -hmm. but one thing i think that we should not move away from is to sort of have the state be the sole custodian of, of violence um i think we've seen that with well, with crime and well you can all class say it's this need so it, it, it isn't it isn't and that's why we have these high levels of crime and you have these these gangs operating in communities where they make sure that people are taken care of. They provide food for a lot of people. Um, but when they're not too happy with something, you know, we see shootings and people are taken out. And again, that's not where we want to be as okay, a country. But that, that's, a, that's the bad side of a destruction of the monopoly of violence. Yeah. The good side of it is that a lot of what keeps this country together, the glue, is in fact that individuals, families, communities, are armed and don't actually care what the police tell them. They carry on with their lives. Not pe people doing bad things, but people who are defending themselves. Security companies in this country are an absolute gold mine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what do they say? That there are more security guards than there are policemen in Gareth, South Africa for the about, population? And I don't think yeah, that's always good. No. But, but I mean... But just think about the, the emotional expenditure of thinking about making sure you are safe. Pro safe, properly armed at all times. I mean, I've covered stories of, of farm murders extensively, and then you speak to these families, um, and then they will just very nonchalantly tell you that the, the kids know what to do if mom and dad are taken out. They know where the weapons are. They know how to defend themselves, and they're like young children. Mm. Um, and these, and these are, Absolutely let's awful. just be honest, these are the farmers with the resources that can invest in private security in some instances. Then you have people also living in rural communities that are much more exposed to violence. And so I just think it's, it's, it is obviously an economic opportunity for private security. And if you, if you know how to use a weapon, good for you, mm. but just personally, how traumatic is that not to go to bed every night thinking, Oh, where's my gun? Mm -hmm. If someone comes in through this door, what am I going to do? We could just be so much more productive as a country if we did not have to worry about that. So I think just yeah, keeping state monopoly of violence there is sure. where I would want to go. Yeah, yeah. I just think that the, if you take it's the not whole, realistic. I get if it. If you take the whole of human history, like yeah. the anomaly, yeah, yeah. the anomaly is is actually peace. It's not yeah. war. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, this is the most peaceful we've ever been as a. As I, a I would as a, say all three world. of us around this table and people ten, twenty years older than us and people ten, twenty years younger than us are probably the luckiest people in human history. Without a doubt. Without a shadow of a doubt. 
we've started to think that, you know, violence is not part of the norm and that we don't have to think about our safety the and security shouldn't every be day. At war. Mm. Yeah, and that the state will look after you. But this is just not the way that it has been for anyone else on earth at any given time. Put put your finger on the timeline anywhere. Yep. And this is not the case. You basically woke up in the morning and you're like, I hope I make it to nighttime. <laughs> <laughs> and if you did. And if you if you survived with only a few cuts and scrapes as opposed to you know, being yeah. dead, you were yeah. like, whoa, I made it. Yep. But, but I do hear you. And it is it is essentially a, a kind of post-traumatic stress yeah. disorder that so many people are just surviving on a day-to-day basis because of yeah, you know, horror I mean, stories everywhere. Yeah. When you think about it, I mean, it's 2024. We thought we would have gone to a place whereby, uh, I imagine when I was, what, 10 years old or whatever. Wait, how old are you now? I'm 34 now. Okay. So when I was 10, uh, I imagined in 2024, there'd be flying cars. And I don't think I was the only one who thought that way. <laughs> and now Why look at us. Like, where, where are the flying cars? <laughs> we barely have electricity. Can you imagine? Somehow <laughs> we've gone backwards, we've gone backwards. Yeah. instead of forwards, right? So I think with all the innovative ways that we have changed our lives to this point, I, you know, you can forgive me for thinking that we, could have solved a lot more problems than the ones we've actually created. Um, there's, there's, there was this app that Kamala Damdala talked about some time back. I don't know if they actually did it, but it's like an emergency app on your yeah, phone. Yeah. Mm. If you are being attacked or anything like that, you just press the button and it kind of alerts the people around you. That way of thinking has not become front and center in this country. Instead, it seems as if we're constantly running around putting out fires. Mm. No, it's everyone and women for themselves. Yeah. Did you see that, That um, I think it's in, in, in New York on the subway station, there are these cards <laughs> because we've had a lot of attacks and people yeah. being shoved in front of the train. Um, so they've got this card and you, you give it to <laughs> someone standing close to you and it says, please stand closer. Someone's harassing me. If you see an escalation. Oh, call, you have to hand them a card? Yeah, a little, a little card. Oh, I'll, wow. I'll send you a screenshot. Um but that's also because the, the 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 authority in New York is just not prosecuting bad behavior. Yeah. And if someone does something good, like there was this uh, Daniel someone or another dude who like he, yes, he actually, he actually yeah. stood up for somebody on a train mm-hmm. and then this this drug addict uh, had a heart attack or he beat him up or whatever and then he was he was prosecuted mm-hmm. for being the good Samaritan. Yeah. So, but I think it's it's interesting because I think we do have given how I mean Crime knows no race um, mm-hmm. class. It, it doesn't discriminate in that way. But I, I've also done a lot of stories on on people sort of standing up for each other, coming mm. together as a community, mm. working together to solve problems. Um, and I, yeah, that's what a crisis um, sort of necessitates. And we so many crises that we we also have amazing examples of South Africans working together. All right, so mm-hmm. I'm going to do what everybody does to you at uh, dinner parties and brides and all um, the rest of it. Say, oh, come on, so what do you think is going to happen? But have you met anyone from any of these political parties? Have you had any conversations with any of these leaders that have immediately given you an optimistic sense of hope or have made you go, oh, my God, we're in even worse shit than I thought? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that, Gareth. Um, <laughs> in gesprek. In gesprek. Wat het jy geleer in gesprek? <laughs> um, I will say one of my um, family member recently says, your show should be in die kak. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you what, yeah. do something for the, um, I mean, I'm sure your ratings are excellent, but that would definitely bring a few more people. Special, a special election, special. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, now, Gareth, I'm um, always optimistic. Uh, that's just my demeanor and, 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 not because of what the politicians say, but because of what everyday South Africans say. Mm-hmm. And again, we should remember this is a democracy conversation and that's what sure. it's about. It's about the people. It's not about these parties. Mm. Um, and I've had a few conversations with some of these leaders, you know, off the record where you, you do sort of get the, the, the impression that there is a, an understanding of how angry and upset and just moodless South Africans are. Whether we see a change in political messaging leading up to the election, we might not. But I think regardless of what happens, I think it's it's a mistake to think that all of this country's problems will be solved following this election if we vote the right way. Mm. Even if we, I mean, just look at this doomsday scenario that the ANC, or that the DA are banding about. We can't have the, the ANC, the EFF and the MK working together. But I mean, they forget that at some point, these three party leaders were in the same, same party. party. Mm. 
this sort of doomsday scenario. <laughs> We've had that and we survived it. It was all mm. under one roof. Under one yep. roof. And one they, had a, they had a more than 66% majority. Yep. You know, yeah. that could change the constitution and yet they didn't. So, and we survived that. So, we don't, survived look, that, don't right. look at the politicians um, for <laughs> look solutions. at ordinary people. Look at ordinary mm -hmm. people. Look at yourself as well. That's mm. where it should start. Yep. Um, well, don't yeah. they say that you get the government you deserve? Yeah, but I have such a problem with like some of these analysts saying, oh, well, you know, see what, you know, blaming the voters. And we see this a lot with ANC voters saying, oh, but you deserve stage 16 or whatever load mm -hmm. shedding because you kept voting for this party. But I refuse to believe that. You know, the Gorgos sitting in a Lundi or wherever voted for that. No, I think that, it's she, patronizing. that she actually she wanted to hurt herself. Exactly. Mm. I think it's patronizing. I think it's yeah. um, it's problematic to think in those terms. Um, I don't know. I don't quite know what the solution is to solving that issue. Well, but, it's 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 about people getting active. Like mm. a lot of us have, we we wax poetic about you know. I, I would do this or I would come up with this. This guy is a problem because of that. But n none of us are actually putting boots on the ground and actually doing well, things to it. change there, things. There, there are. I mean, this is where the real heroes in South Africa are. And we've we've tried to also focus on, on them in this show and, and on other shows that we've done here, where you, you meet people who in communities are making a huge difference. They're looking mm -hmm. after other people's children fixing while they're the at work. Mm -hmm. They're fixing the potholes. They're fixing the they are they're building schools. Absolutely. Yep. With their own hands, they're doing all this stuff. So there are people who are doing this stuff. Unfortunately, they're not going to run the place as per our conversation earlier because they don't have the ego to mm. imagine themselves as being president. Mm. And, and we, we have a useless lot to think that they deserve to be sent to well, the union see, building. <laughs> like if, <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm always reticent to criticize Mandela because I thought, thought that what happened above reproach. Well, I don't know that, but I think that what happened in South Africa in 94 was a, a pretty beautiful story and i don't mm. want to be one a miracle one of those you know uh what do they call them post uh fact uh, analysts who come in and say well if we revise history it could have been better mm. right? yeah, yeah somehow yeah. we would know better we would do a better job in 94 if we were in charge nonsense it but is. what i do think if he, if he did us any disservice at all it was by giving us the savior complex this idea that we need one iconic person like mm. a jesus to pull us out of the, the trouble mm -hmm. And it's not going to happen. No, right? it's never going to happen. What again. you said, and, so, and not just in South Africa, worldwide. Everywhere. Mm -hmm. Is there a single leader in the world that you look at now and go, well, if we just had him, he would solve all of our problems? And if you do, you're naive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think there's a great opportunity in that. And I think this is an evolution as, as humanity where we are moving past this, hopefully. And again, maybe in, in 100 years, we will have another Mandela or I can't even think of a, an international. Uh, example on that and on that same mm. level but for now i think it it creates opportunity for people to look past political solutions mm -hmm. um and just to come back to violence i mean it 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 it, cre it creates a necessity for innovation we've got an amazing innovative minds in this country working on solutions for our problems away from the politics and again i have to give credit and i'm i'm not saying this just because you have an afrikaans show on cakenet but i've got to give credit to the afrikaans people in this country there's uh, you know p groups like afri forum and solidariteit and those kinds of guys who built universities mm -hmm. they've schools. Uh, they've schools they've stood up for their people in court they've mm -hmm. stood up for other people in court who are not necessarily from their community yeah. they're getting things changing yeah. making things better in small and big ways and I think that that's amazing. And I've got to give credit to CakeNet. I mean, CakeNet's launched a bunch of really, really interesting shows. And if you don't speak Afrikaans, I mean, a lot of these shows have subtitles. Mm -hmm. So you can go and see them where they've got very, very smart people who are asking interesting questions, getting interesting answers. It's locally made. These are the kinds of discussions everybody's saying, oh, we need more of this, but they're happening. And shows yeah. like yours are Please doing yeah. in. Monday nights, yeah. 8.30. I was like, and for so, yeah. Before she goes, before yes. you go. Yeah. So there was a question that Penel asked during our Democracy Unplugged. He's fascinating, that guy. <laughs> he is, right? Yeah. Have you had him on your show? No, I haven't. I I'm traveled to Russia with him. Okay. Oh, That's okay. a different story, but yeah. Mm, cool. <laughs> okay. So uh, he asked our panelists, who are you voting for? And if you were to advise, the poor population of this country, mm. who would you tell oh. them to vote for? Tough, tough, tough question. Um, well, I mean, I can't endorse uh, a specific party. Sure. Um, but all I will say is 
you as a voter just do your research do a bit of i mean just take an hour between now and 29th of may it's not going to kill you and just do some cursory reading on what these parties stand for what the policies are not just what they promise and what they've done look at the track record judge them by the actions not the words mm -hmm. stay away from these fantastic elaborate tiktok social media youtube videos and clips these viral moments stay away from that look at a long period of what in in certain instances where these parties are in power where they govern where they are able to make a difference and then make an informed choice i know it's a bit of a cop out jack i'm sorry no it's cool i love it no you, I, you it. I don't i don't want you to tell us who you're going to vote for yeah. and in south africa we don't have a we don't have a tradition of people having to say yeah, no, who no. they're going to vote for no. just a and last thing think... as well just vote yeah, yeah. yeah. regardless of okay. who you vote for just go out and vote mm -hmm. All right. Well, listen, that's a strong place to end it. Um, in gesprek met uh, Lorenzo Eckhart is on uh, uh, Monday. Half half there we go. There we go. On CakeNet, and you do that show live. Yes. It's amazing. Very cool. If you haven't watched it before, you need to check it out. So, Lorenzo Eckhart, bye. Thank you that you vandaag samen met ons hier so kon gesels het. Bye. Thank you. And I hope we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. Awesome. That's it for us for today. And we will see you tomorrow. No, tomorrow's Wednesday. Thursday morning, 6 a.m. Cheers, everyone.